Pod Strings, the Warm Podcast, a United Methodist conversation brought to you by the Central Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church. I am Daniel Hawkins, pastor at Martin UMC and host for this conversation. As we begin this new series of conversations, we will be wrestling with how are we good ancestors for those who follow us? What church will we be handing to the next generation? And as we get started in this series of conversations, we are incredibly excited to be joined by the man who is pushing us in this direction, the man, the myth, the legend, the man who goes fast or faster, and frankly, the man who is most importantly, Maya Signs Arm Candy. That's right. Bishop Ruben Signs. We are incredibly thankful that you are here with us today on Pod Strangely Warmed. You, You have shared with us this moment in your life that seems incredibly foundational, where you held your first grandchild for the first time. And and amid that flood of emotions and spirit, you were wrestling with the question, what church will I give to this child? That's right. Um, I'd wonder, you know, we're going to get to what that church looks like over the next 30 minutes or so, but I'd love to hear who has maybe been those folks who, who metaphorically or literally held you in their hands and wondered what church will they give to you and help you become the leader, the pastor, and the follower of Jesus you are today. Daniel, thanks for doing this. Oh, and I, I'm looking forward to the conversation. But in my office, I have a, an old um, black and white picture. And it's it's of my mom, probably in the 60s, because I'm, I'm, I, I don't know how what age I am, but I'm really young. Okay. And it's me and, and five other children around a table uh, doing a Sunday school lesson. Mm. And, and I have that picture there because when I think about who formed me in the faith, yeah. right, I had, I had the example of my parents, mm. but I also had the teachings of the church through Sunday school and mm. vacation Bible school and things like that. So, so I have that picture of my mom uh, and my brother and Aaron Montemayor and Omar Peña and others studying the, the Cokesbury curriculum. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, those stories over, over the years have become um, principles that I draw from and that have shaped my, my life, my leadership, uh, my outlook, my relationships with other people. So they were foundational mm. at, at that age. And of course, it, when, I, when I talk about the, the practical, you know, P- Paul said, um, follow me, right? Mm. L- look look yeah. at me, look at how I live my life. And so I, I was very blessed in that both of my parents were people of faith. One, remember one time when I was, Oh, probably in my early teens, my, my, my dad got my brother and I together, and he said, okay, we're going to talk about our budget. Okay, mm. so, was, okay. So, yeah. so let's talk about the budget. Yeah. And I was, I, was hearing to, I was waiting to hear how much was going to be left for our allowance. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he took the out the checkbook, questions. and he said, you know, your mom and I make X amount mm. of, of, a, a month. And from, and from here, we start paying our, our bills. And so he had a stack of bills mortgage and all that kind of stuff. So, but the first check goes to the church. Mm. So he sat down, he wrote the, the tithe to the church. He said, this goes to the church. Now we pay our bills. Now mm. we do our savings. And now this is what we have left. Yeah. And so I, I was remembering at, at age 13 that that was an, a significant moment for me in discipleship and, and mm. how we are stewards of all things. So so when I, I draw upon those memories, it, uh, it, it helps me recognize that, that they were pouring into me, and now I'm pouring into others because because that's the way that faith happens. It goes yeah. from one generation to the next, and now I pour into my children. They're pouring into their children, my grandchildren, yeah. and it goes on and on and on. And so, uh, and of course, I had several Sunday school teachers, uh, pastors, seminary professors, and uh, and colleagues that helped mm-hmm. shape my faith. And and just yeah. So when I when I look at how we're formed. Mm. And I'm not yeah. just talking about living people. I'm talking about writers and authors who took the time to, to pen their theology and to pen their thoughts about the church and that I've read. Wesley, for example, yeah. is one oh, of them yeah. uh, that, has, that has helped shape my understanding of, of the church then, now, and for tomorrow. Amen. That's that tradition, that great mm-hmm. cloud of witnesses mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. sends around us. 
uh, we can all remember that person in our life and our journey. Uh, Miss Williams was one of my Sunday school yeah, teachers yeah, at yeah, Central UMC yeah. in Waco back many moons ago. Yeah. And I then had her for business uh, statistics right. at Baylor uh, many wow. moons later. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it was a fantastic little full circle moment. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder, I hope our, our listeners today are able to remember those who have formed them, who yeah. helped them catch the faith that they might share it with others. And here's the thing is sometimes Sunday school teachers or, or Bible school teachers, they, they don't really see mm. the end result. Yeah. And, and they think, you know, they go home and they might say, nobody paid attention today. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, right. it doesn't take much. It was 8.30 for <laughs> in the morning. The children were very tired. Uh, doesn't take much for the gospel seed to, yeah. to be planted and then to, to, to grow mm. later on in life. And so we have to be faithful yeah. even when we don't see the, the fruit of our work. Absolutely. <laughs> well, this weekend, as we're recording yeah, yeah. this, is winter camp at Glen Lake Camp. Right. And we've got, we're sending a group of students from our church. Okay. And our deep abiding prayer is that mm. they might have one of those seed plants planting yeah, yeah, experiences yeah. Uh, of the love and grace of Jesus Christ in the midst of the work of the annual conference, in the midst of the work of the camp, mm -hmm. and in the midst of a weekend away from their normal rhythms and routines yeah, yeah. that God might be present. Um, so good. So good. A as you shared, I couldn't help but think uh, of just how much faith is is not just taught, it's caught. It's caught, yeah. Right? Exactly. Um, and, and we find ourselves in one of these moments in which it, frankly, as a denomination, as United States Christianity, we may have been caught in our head for mm -hmm. too long, mm -hmm. and we may be being invited into a, a lived space, mm -hmm. right, where we've engaged in a lot of theological arguments mm -hmm. rather than living the faith. Mm -hmm. You've named this as, a, as an opportunity for us, as an inflection point in the right, life of right. our church, right? We're at a place where tomorrow will be different, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Right, right. Um, and in that conversation, you've you've helped us begin to dream of a church of 2050. Mm -hmm. right? When you think of the church of 2050, right, what do you think that looks like? And what's your process for coming to a vision of what that might be? Well, first of all, it's not something that is is um, predicated on on um, just my imagination. I mean, we yeah. we have people, right, researchers Absolutely. that talk about what the the Gen Z generation mm. is going to be, and uh, and what the Alpha generations are going to look like, and and what some of their 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 ways of living and understanding, and what some of the issues that they'll be facing will be. We mm. we have people that are already futurists, and they're looking at the future and, yeah. and already predicting because of the signaling that's happening and the tr and the trends that are that are going on. Right. We already have some knowledge. That that was a point of my. Uh, Episcopal address at the jurisdictional conference. It, it's not. Let's not pretend that we don't know. We we already have people that are already telling mm. us what the future is going to look like. The yeah. question for us is, if we know that's going to be happening, what are the steps we need to take today to converge at that point with mm. with an expression of our faith that is meaningful and relevant, and that communicates the gospel in ways that are inviting to a people that. For, for you know increasingly are becoming spiritual but not religious right, right. yeah and uh, and and what does a faith mean to them and how do they then take the Christian faith and apply it to their lives through their vocations or through the different places where they find themselves within our community and within our world and become advocates for for justice for peace for for uh, uh, for uh, ethics that are that are helpful and wholesome for all people, um, yeah. And so, when I start thinking about about that church and what that will look like, I, I have to leave myself the, the space to imagine um, a church that that may look very different than than the way that it does now. And when mm. I'm talking about church, I think most of when we think about church, we think about buildings. Right, right, right. Let's go to church. So right. Let's go to it's a, a location, space. Yep. right? But the people are the church, and mm. and so the form, the forms w with which we do church, right? Which are which are buildings. These are the containers where the faith is is uh, is, is propagated, right? As as right. As, it, as disseminated in, in a building, uh, we we know that that's rapidly changing. So so what are the forms? The the function of faith will will not change. It must continue. Yeah. But the forms with which it is conveyed must constantly be reevaluated, mm. so that it it uh, it becomes 
um, relevant to the people that will receive it. Yeah. And so. As you have this conversation, uh, I'm in a TMF group, uh, Courageous mm-hmm. Leadership Institute, mm-hmm. and they took us to Seattle uh, mm-hmm. over the summer. Fantastic place to be in July. Yeah. Not yeah, Texas. Yeah, yeah. Seattle's great. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's amazing. But part of that was so that we might begin to cultivate that future orientation mm-hmm. because that is a community and a space that both just because of the, the nature of technology and things, is is a future focused future oriented right, space right. and in a kind of post christendom culture right they have moved farther along that journey than we have still mm-hmm. in the buckle of the bible mm-hmm. belt mm-hmm. here in, mm-hmm. in texas um but as we were there one of the conversations we had was with a church leader who said he had a 300 year vision for his church mm-hmm. And I, and my first gut reaction was, what an act of hubris, right? <laughs> uh, you know, I, right? I, I can have an ego, and I'm sure we all can have an ego, but mm-hmm. how on earth do you get there? But the way they had got it down to was they looked for the 2,000 years of the Christian church mm-hmm. and looked at what are those foundational practices that help form right. and shape the heart of the church, right, right. not the expression of the church, right. but the heart of the church, right. that then we believe that those practices and expression and that heart will be there 300 years from now, even if the expression is radically different. Right. And I think some, so often that invitation uh, can cause a little anxiety. Sure. Because the expression of the church is what it is because we like it that way mm-hmm. and because it's been meaningful to us mm-hmm. that way and mm-hmm. because it's been um, formative for our souls and mm-hmm. for our spirits, right? Right. And yet um, clarity is, is knowing where you're going but not being attached to how you get there. Exactly. Uh, where have you in your own personal journey found yourself attached to a form or an expression that you later learned that that's good for me, but that's not great for everybody? Or that may not be the only way for somebody to experience uh, the work of Christ in the midst of, of what is to come? For me, the faith has been a journey. Mm-hmm. All of us are born in, into family systems, into communities, into cultures. That, that shape our outlook and our worldview. Yeah. And and, uh, and if we're not careful, we can universalize that and, and look at mm-hmm. everybody through that through that lens and then yeah. judge whether they're yeah. friend or foe, <laughs> right. with us or against us. Yeah. And and we recognize when we step outside of, of the of the boundaries, the cultural, racial, ethnic, theological boundaries that, that that have formed and shaped us when we step into other mm. contexts yeah. uh, where we intersect with other people that are different, then we have a choice. We either <clears throat> seclude ourselves again and isolate mm. ourselves and go back into our enclave yeah. or, or we become open to, to what the others have to say and, and what we can mm. learn from them. Yeah. And so I find that it, in my journey, I have my own personal convictions and, and, and beliefs, but at the same time, I find them being transformed, mm. right? As I experience the the world. One of one of the things that one of the questions that I often have when I go like to an airport, for example, and I'm sitting at you know a major airport yeah. waiting for the flight to go out, and I see people from all walks of life. You know, moving through through the hallways and sitting next to me, and and I ask myself, "Wow, God, you love all these people." Mm. And I come to recognize the poverty of my own love and the limits of mm. the people that I love, right? Because yeah. they're normally family, friends, associates, right. neighbors, things like that. But right. but the love of God is so expansive. Mm. Um, and and so when I think about the the love of God, and the mercy of God, and and the and the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God, it it's much beyond myself. So so it, it's that knowledge that stretches me mm. towards the other, and sometimes yeah. out of myself. Yeah. And um, for the sake of the other, mm. you yeah. know, when Paul says, yeah. "I become all things to all people that I may win them to Christ." Right. He was functioning outside of the realm of, of his formation. Yeah, that's not his default that's lane not, that he likes to be default. in. No, yeah. like Peter, right? Like yeah. when we read Acts chapter 10, yeah. uh, and, and the subtitles in the Bible always say that the conversion of Cornelius, it wasn't about the conversion of Cornelius, it was about the conversion of Peter. 
Mm. Peter had to let go of his hang-ups that he had towards towards the the Gentiles, so he could get to where God mm. was leading him. Yeah. And so, had Peter not not been liberated from his biases and from his upbringing and, and from all of his prejudices, yeah, the world would have been very different. Mm. And so, and so, I think discipleship is a push beyond ourselves. And if you even if you look at the great commandment. First Jerusalem, that which we know. Right. <laughs> then Judea, then Samaria, then the ends of the world. But once you start crossing those things, you're crossing all kinds of boundaries. Right. Where you might not be the majority, mm. where your viewpoint might be in the minority, and, and yet you have to engage and have a conversation with people who yeah. have a very different understanding of how the world works, mm. right? Yeah. Uh, and so and so I, th- I think that's the challenge of of our faith, but that's also the richness and, and the beauty and and the growth in our understanding of God's love and even our own discipleship. As you speak, I'm reminded of Paul at Mars Hill yeah. in, in Acts, right? Yeah. The You have seen these other guys, you know, he, he frames, poets. right, your Did poets, they? he frames the understanding of who God is yeah. as we understand God mm-hmm. within a lens that they can see and understand. But he acknowledges their culture, their upbringing, mm-hmm. their, 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 their authorities, their poets, yeah. their philosophers. He, he knows them yeah. because, because he's, he has studied them, mm. and, and yet he can bring them to a higher understanding of, of Christ, you know, yeah. he, despite all that. And yeah. so, but, but had he approached them with the Torah says, Right, it right. would have been. It, it would have been like, like you know, this get guy out of here, again. Right? Yeah. Like, what are you well, talking about? You know, I, I tell the story a thousand times. I was this is an odd thing, but I was in Las Vegas for a young person's church conference. Right, right. The Western jurisdiction yeah, put it on. Yeah. So who knows? Um, but uh, as we were walking this, we had a blank time. We were walking the strip just to experience, just to say, what is going on yeah, here, right? Yeah. And a street corner preacher with his loud mm-hmm. bullhorn stood up on top of a box and was screaming us all down, yeah, right? Yeah. And his default position was, you are a terrible, no good, very bad, sorry right, sucker, right. right? And as a preacher, as a person who wants people to come to know Christ fully and completely and have their lives transformed by him, I wanted him to shut up, mm. right? Because his spirit wasn't what you described, right? right? He didn't right. honor um, where the community was coming from while also inviting them to something deeper and bigger and grander. Yeah. Um, in my office sits a, a picture of a, a cartoon drawing uh, of Jesus and a bunch of people. And the people have giant pencils in their hand, and they're drawing boxes around mm-hmm. themselves. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Jesus is standing in the middle of one of those boxes, but his pencil is flipped upside down, and he's erasing, erasing the mm-hmm. lines that connect us. I or that. A- Prevent us from being connected. When I when I had my my business, I think we all go through these phases, right? Where yeah. you know, we 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 found the truth, and by golly, you're going to believe our truth, right, whether right, you know right. you like it or not. And uh, I had a a person that I was trying to bring to faith, mm. and he was a Vietnam veteran, wonderful man. And, and we would have conversations when I was in my jewelry business, and he would come by to sell me advertisements for the town newspaper. Okay. And so we had all of these conversations about God and everything else like that. And, and one day he turned to me and he said, you know what? He said, everything you might say about God is true. Mm. I just can't receive it. Okay. I, I said, why? Why not? I mean, that's evident. He said, because there's no love in it. Mm. Mm. The way that you talk about God, there's no love of God. And why would God want me? Mm. And that moment stopped me in my tracks yeah. because you know, I was a young lion and I wanted, you know, to to collect all the souls and right, you right. Know, bring them to Jesus. And and uh, instead of winning them over, I I mm. repelled them. And that's always been, you know, my my concern, right? That that mm. we become stumbling blocks to people that have questions and, yeah. and that want to know more about the faith. Yeah. Mm. Well, I was going to ask you next. Mm. What wisdom do you hope we can hand to the next generation? But I think you've just dropped one of those nuggets of wisdom that we hope we can hand to the next generation, right? How can we, in a, in a culture and, and so focused on being right, mm-hmm. choose often to be loving even when we're correct? 
right? Yeah. You know, the idol meat controversy in 1 Corinthians 8. Right. Right, where, where Paul says, look, we know it's just a holy barbecue, and there's really nothing holy to it. It's just good food. Right. But you might cause someone else to stumble. Right. So don't go. Right. Right. Hmm. What other pieces of wisdom might you hope to be able to hand to, to those of us who are stepping into leadership into the church now or who've been in leadership for 10, 15 years who are helping to shape and form the church that will uh, raise and then be handed to your grandson? Mm-hmm. I think that we live in a world where a lot of people want certainty. Mm. And we can be certain about things. We know that God has promised Christ has promised to be with us until the end of the age. That, yes. That's a certainty. Uh, we know that God's love is never never ceasing, mm. and God's mercies are new every morning. We, we know these things. Uh, but there's other, and, and people want very simple answers to complex situations, mm. right, that, that we do not yet have all the information or light about. Yeah. And so I, I always think I'm going to hold this view provisionally until I get further light about it. But, mm. but for today, this is where I am. Yeah. And I'm not closing the door on any more understanding or growth because I think a sense of curiosity is important mm. and also a sense that, that what somebody else has to say or share is just as valuable and I cannot dismiss it because because hierarchically we might be in different mm. l- levels of the hierarchy or the spectrum and so it's this it's this openness to to learn from the other it, it, which mm. requires a yeah. posture of humility yeah and to know that I don't know everything yeah and the more I know <laughs> yeah. about something the more I need to know right um, and so and and that's the way that I that I try to lead yeah. with with humility, mm. try, trying to sense and discern where we need to go, but at the same time listening to to where the spirit is calling us to go, and then join mm. with that. Yeah, even if it's sometimes in a different pathway than I would have chosen to go. Yeah. So it's it's this it's this ability to bend and and and, mm. to, and to move. Uh, in a world that is that is rapidly changing, with, with with some solid convictions and principles that are guiding right. us and some values, but at the same time open to where the spirit is leading. Mm. A, a generous and humble and curious orthodoxy, maybe. Yeah. Um, hmm. Beautiful, and, and I think we'd all do well to embrace that as we try to move forward together. And, and here's the thing recognizing the gifts and graces of people uh, around and mm. and helping others to flourish to the best that they can because as the more that others flourish mm. the more we all flourish yeah. so how how can i inspire and encourage others mm. to to be their best selves yeah. um and to and to lead out of their giftedness and out of their goodness um for the sake, not just for themselves, but also for the sake of those that Christ has entrusted to them, yeah. um, whether it be their family, their, their their businesses, their communities, their school districts, their yeah. their, their hospitals or universities or whatever, um, or even the churches that pastors pastor. Mm. So. so that, as Jesus says in the Lord Prayer, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done, may earth be more like heaven. Mm-hmm. Like I think if we're all living more completely into who God has invited us to be and is creating us to be, yeah. earth becomes a little more like heaven in all of those places and spaces. Uh, we are coming near to the close of our time, and so I've got one final question sure, for you. Sure. Uh, as a lifelong follower of Jesus, as somebody who's been on a journey and, and morphed and changed and kind of held this curious and humble um, spirit, to your walking with Christ, as as folks seek to, to follow Jesus into that church of 2050, know, what kind of personal, foundational, spiritual practices help guide and shape your spirit and you think might uh, form a foundation for a church whose expression may be different in the future, but also will have a, a generous heart and a, you know that same spirit? What kinds of uh, personal faith practices uh, 
do you think will help form and shape uh, God's people as we move toward that direction? And I think the word is practice, mm. right? Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we practice because we have not yet perfected, but it, mm. everything's a practice in our relationships, in our, um, in, in our ways that we encounter uh, Christ through scriptures, mm. through reflection, through meditation, uh, in the ways that we pray. Prayer opens us up. Scripture opens us up to mm-hmm. new possibilities that God is doing. I, I, from from the practice sense, is you know we participate in the corporate practices of worship and and Christian fellowship and the the partaking of the sacraments and things mm-hmm. like that. But also in our in our daily practices, we have to be continuous learners. Mm-hmm. We learn about others, learn about the world around us, learn about the world that's coming, and mm-hmm. and. And lift that up in prayer and say, okay, God, what part do I play in yeah. all of this, right? Yeah. And then find our place and mm. and uh, and lead from there in whatever capacity we can. Uh, and trusting that as we're doing our work, there's many, many others. Uh, one of the, the things that, <laughs> that God told Elijah was like, you think you're the only one that's having a hard time? There's 7,000 others, right, that are, that are serving me. Yeah. So sometimes we might feel that, that we are isolated, it's only us against the mm. planet. That's not true. Yeah. We have to have faith that the same spirit that's at work in us is at work in many, many other people. Mm. Uh, and how do we unite ourselves with that, connect ourselves to that, and trust that God is up to something even though we don't understand it or see it? Mm. But that we're all working and moving towards that, that reign of, of yeah. that beautiful reign that Christ talked about that is present and still yet to come, right? Mm. Yeah. So, Amen. And, and that, that, that vision of our work here is, is, a, is a tiny fraction mm. of yeah. God's magnificent enterprise. Yeah. And to be able to be at peace with that, mm. while at the same time not dismissing it because it is so small. Right. But doing it with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength, right, yeah. and uh, and all of our all of our will. Um, the world is not ours to change on our own, no, but no. we can change our own corner of it. Exactly, and trust that that's enough. Exactly. Mm. Bishop, thank you so much for your time today. I know you've got a docket that's about as full <laughs> as can be. And so thank you for joining us today on Pod Strangely Warmed. I hope and pray that God is with you and journeys with you and that the Spirit is palpable through whatever the rest of your day carries. And know thank that you, on behalf Daniel. of the Central Texas Conference, we are so incredibly thankful for you and for your leadership. And, and we're thankful that we get to delight in Maya's presence as well. She is <laughs> such an incredible, incredible joy. Thank you. I will let her know that. And uh, she's super excited to be in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. So, yeah, Yeah. thank you, Daniel, for this. Amen. And go Cowboys? Next year. Next year. The Cowboys Cowboys (laughs) anthem. Next year. There's always next year. Take care. Thank you, Bishop. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today on Pod Strangely Warmed. I hope and pray you were encouraged by our amazing conversation with Bishop Ruben Sines. As we continue in the weeks to come, we will have further conversations with ancestors in our faith, ancestors in our very midst here in the Central Texas Conference, folks who have shaped and formed the church we have and who will help us dream as we shape and form the church that is to come. If today's conversation was good to your spirit or good to your soul, I I ask, who might you want to share this with? Who might you want to gather together over coffee or over lunch to dive deeper into the nuggets of wisdom that Bishop Signs left for us today? It truly will be an incredible series of conversations as we go forward. Until next time, I'm Daniel Hawkins, and thank you for joining us at Pod Strangely Warmed.